Okay, new book I'm going to start from today is Being Wagner, The Triumph of the Will by Simon Callow. Uh, it's, you can see it's spelled like Wagner, but I believe it's pronounced Wagner. Right, so uh, why am I starting this book? Um, I've been interested, vaguely interested, n not obsessively interested, but vaguely interested in Wagner for a while now. And about 10 years ago, I was looking to track down a readable biography of Wagner. Nothing, nothing too academic, you know, just like a nice readable armchair biography for somebody who's vaguely interested but not obsessively interested. And I couldn't find one anywhere. So I ended up reading Wagner, a documentary study, just because that's what they had in my local library. Uh, my local library at the time being Oita Prefecture out in Japan, so admittedly the selection of English books was limited. But that's all I could find. Uh, and I reviewed it on the blog at the time, and I even gave it a review on this YouTube uh, channel a, a few weeks back. And uh, in the YouTube review, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd really love to find a readable biography of Wagner. And in fact, I believe I said, I actually saw one in the bookstore a few months ago, and I didn't pick it up, and I'm kicking myself now for not having picked it up. So then I was back in the same bookstore, and I saw what I believe was the same biography. I don't actually remember. Pretty sure this was the same one. And so I thought to myself, well, I just got done saying on my YouTube channel that I would pick it up again if I had the chance. So now I really have to pick it up, even though I wasn't exactly sure I was in the mood for this or not. Uh, I, you know, I tend to go around in interests, go in cycles of interests, uh, meaning what I'm interested in on Sunday might not be the same thing I'm interested in on Monday. Uh, so I... Uh, just because I'm interested in, in things at a certain time doesn't mean, doesn't always mean that I'll pick up the book if I see it uh, a few weeks or a few years later. But after having said on the YouTube channel that I would pick it up again if I had the chance, then I thought, okay, I'm really going to have to pick this one up. Uh, so, uh, why am I interested in Wagner? And, and again, keep in mind that this is all from the perspective of somebody who's knows a little bit, but not a lot. But, but from the little bit I know, he seems like a very fascinating figure. Uh, his whole ring cycle, the, the, you know, with the Norse mythology and the Vikings and the Valkyries uh, and all of that, uh, appeals to me as somebody who's always been vaguely interested in mythology and fantasy. And I think especially nowadays, when, when these Norse myths are so much in the popular culture, right, the, the Lord of the Rings movies, which were... I believe Tolkien's work was based on Norse mythology. And, you know, all this is, again, in pop culture with uh, the Marvel movies and Thor and Ragnarok and all that stuff now. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it, it interests me to figure out how this came into the pop culture in the first place. And I think Wagner's ring cycle of operas is a pretty good place to point to where this stuff started to become mainstream. Um, in other words, I think maybe Wagner led to Tolkien. Or am I wrong? I, I mean, ha has, has this stuff always been of interest to intellectuals and writers? I don't know. But, but the other thing that strikes, is of interest to me, is Wagner's politics and how he is um, both associated with radical left-wing politics and... Uh, unfortunately, ultra-right-wing politics. And when I say ultra-right-wing, I mean the, the Nazis, essentially. So he, he does have a liberal streak to him. He was a participant in the revolutions of 1848. He was on the barricades in Dresden with uh, anarchist Mikhail Bakunin. Um, but he was also anti-Semitic throughout his life. And I don't know how much to make of the anti-Semitism because... Uh, you know, I was listening to Revolution's podcast recently, and they were talking about the legacy of Bakunin, and uh, Bakunin was also anti-Semitic all throughout his life. Uh, and they said, you know, in 19th century politics, anti-Semitism was just everywhere. It was on the left wing, it was on the right wing, it was just in the water at the time, in the air at the time. Um, but Hitler was a big fan of Wagner. And uh, Hitler really ate up the anti-Semitism that was in Wagner's writings, I believe. 
So that's the rather uncomfortable legacy of Wagner, which is, hopefully I don't need to point this out, but this is not good. Uh, the fact that uh, Wag Wagner was co-opted by the Nazis, or that, that Hitler and the Nazis were such fans of Wagner. But it does maybe add to the fascination of it. Uh, somebody who on the one hand can be associated with the barricades and the liberalism, and on the other hand was associated with the Nazis and the anti-Semitic um, anti -Semitic politics. So untangling all of that, I think, is part of the fascination. Uh, I really have no ear for classical music. Um, and really no patience for the opera. So I'm a bit of a philistine when all of that is concerned. Um, but that's the appeal of reading a short book on this as opposed to sitting through all four, all 12 hours of the ring cycle. I, I think the ring cycle is supposed to be like this epic opera which takes place over several different nights and each night is three hours long or something like that. As I said, I'm approaching all of this from the perspective of somebody who's vaguely interested but doesn't really know a lot. I, I did read that uh, uh, that documentary study on Wagner about 10 years ago, but I'm not sure how much I absorbed of that, to be honest. Certainly not 10 years later. So anyways, this was in the bookstore. Uh, found it here in Vietnam, actually. Uh, it looks like a very short, very readable little book. Uh, large print, only clocks in at how many pages is this? Uh, so if, if you cut off the uh, bibliography and the acknowledgments and the index and stuff at the back, the actual text is only 200 pages, so very short. Written by a guy named Simon Callow, who I'd never heard of before. Uh, he's apparently an uh, actor in Britain, famous for being in Four Weddings and a Funeral, which I did see once ages ago, don't really remember much of that. He's written a number of other books on uh, actors and authors and stuff like that. Um, is not a scholar, I believe, so, so this is obviously coming from a non-scholarly perspective, which uh, could be for all the better, could, could make it more readable. Uh, could also make it a bit of fluff, but, but, but that's kind of what I'm looking for, to be honest. I'm, I'm looking for a bit of fluff. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I was just flipping through the index here, uh, looking for the sections on Bakunin. Uh, and, uh, yeah, something that seemed a little bit of a red flag to me is in the section on Bakunin, uh, just flipping through the book, it labels Bakunin as a terrorist. Now, I, I know terror... I don't want to get too into this because this is something I should really save for the book review once I'm all done with it. But I, I'm going to get into this a little bit and then I'll probably double dip and hit it up in the book review as well. But, uh, yeah, I think terrorist... I mean, I know terrorist is a famously ambiguous word in the English language. The whole one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. But I think, especially in recent years, we've loosely settled on a shared definition of terrorist, which is a terrorist is somebody who uh, tries to... Who, who does some sort of mass killings of civilians in an effort to influence government policy. I don't think that's fair to apply that to Bakunin. Bakunin was not a pacifist by any means. He was definitely somebody who favored armed insurrection. So he was an insurrectionist. But I don't think Bakunin ever favored targeted mass killings of civilians. I, th I think Bakunin was somebody who wanted to fight soldiers on the barricades. So insurrectionist, yes. Terrorist, no. All that with a caveat of, again, I'm not an expert, so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It, is, is there some part in Bakunin's writings somewhere where he's advocating terrorism? I'm, I'm not aware of it. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's a bit of a red flag that maybe the language in this book might not be very careful. But, uh, I, that being said, I, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and give this a go in, uh, anyways. Uh... I say this, I should say this every time I start a new book. I always have like 10 unfinished books lying around my apartment at any moment, which makes me incredibly guilty about starting a new one. Uh, like I'm still working through Don Quixote. Uh, been working through this for 
months and years now. But uh, I can be a fickle reader and sometimes I just want a change of pace. And with this whole quarantine, self-quarantine, isolation thing going on, I could really use something to give me a change of pace. And I'm not reading any nonfiction at the moment. Well, sorry, I, I'm reading some teaching methodology books, but I, I don't have any history or biography nonfiction going at the moment. So this should be a nice change of pace. And with any luck, I'll just breeze through this book. It's only 200 pages. Uh, knock it off very quickly and then go back to the other, all the other half-finished books I've got lying around my apartment. Of course, I say that now. Who knows? Maybe I'll get stalled on this one and, and spend months reading this one. But I, I don't anticipate it. I'm going to try and just knock this off very quickly and then come back with a full review when I finished 